as we before we get into week two, I just wanted to give kind of a recap uh, of last week, um, bringing us back to focus again on this topic, um, which again, I feel very passionate about small groups. Um, like I said, not just within the church, but in general, groups are so enriching in letting us see different parts of ourselves and letting us experience different dynamics that are, go beyond just one-on-one -on -one, um, kinds of relationships to just all kinds of interesting things that go on in a group. And among those things is positive kinds of transformations. I know not all group experiences are positive, and, uh, you know, if that's been the case for you in, in certain ways, you know, you can feel a degree of skepticism or um, guardedness coming into a group. And that may be part of what you bring, uh, like we talked last week about um, everybody sort of brings things with them into a group. But my hope is that coming out of both of these presentations that you will, uh, you know, continue to explore groups in your life. And, uh, you know, experiment with some of these strategies that we're going to talk about tonight uh, in creating transformation in groups, especially if you are the leader. So last week we talked about what works in groups, the things that um, that are unique to groups, that they are dynamic, um, they're always changing. So you change one person in a group, add a person or take away a person, the whole dynamic shifts. Um, groups are systems and they are constantly changing. They are alive and, uh, you know, all kinds of things are going on in groups. You and everyone bring something valuable to the group system. Uh, and so I hope you'll continue to ask yourself, what am I bringing into the group? What are other people here bringing into the group? Um, both positive and negative and, and just being able to look at that and uh, observe it, work with it, look for ways for transformation to occur. Another thing that was highlighted last week was the process versus content discussion. And I hope that that's something that, that stuck with you around, um, you know, not just talking about information in groups, not just sharing stories in groups, but going beyond that to bring the group, bring some life into the group when you talk about the process that is happening in the here and now um, in the group. So this is how I'm feeling right now toward you as you say that thing. Um, you know, here's my response that I'm noticing as you share that story. Those are those kind of comments are process comments. So keep those things in mind as we move through this into week two. So just kind of a quick overview of what we're doing in week two. Uh, we're going to go over uh, eight specific strategies for leading well. So now that we have a context and we also talked about the stages of groups last week, we're going to talk about the eight strategies um, that I present in my book, Gather Us In, uh, that I believe really help you lead well and create transformation in the groups. There will be a time for Q&A. Um, I got a question emailed to me this week, which I appreciate that. I just want to say I appreciate that engagement. Um, and that will be part of what I address. But if you have questions that come up as we're going, maybe jot them down and save it for the Q&A uh, section or put them in the chat and we'll um, get to them at that time. We will have breakout rooms again tonight and depending how quickly we're getting through the material and being somewhat flexible with how long we're gonna spend in the breakout rooms, uh, but we'll have a couple of things to discuss in, in the smaller groups at that time. And then uh, you'll come back from the breakout rooms, I hope for the last part, which is putting the strategies into practice and some um, kind of final takeaways. So that's a little bit what we're gonna do tonight. So these eight strategies for leading well, I'm just gonna touch on them here and then go more in depth to each one. Uh, the practice faith is the, the kind of foundational first step having to do with kind of both, both on a personal level and a social level, how are you practicing your faith as kind of a foundation for the group? Focus has to do with, uh, just like it sounds, I mean, creating some type of focus for the group so it's not too loosely defined. Uh, you can think of it, you know, kind of in like in yoga, if you set an intention, you know, it's sort of like having an intention for the group. 
Uh, the third strategy is stretch, but not too far. And this one just basically has to do with boundaries. Um, I'm going to be talking some about that tonight. Listen well is the fourth strategy. And this one sounds so simple, but often um, I feel like I learn over and over that simple is not necessarily the same as easy. Um, listening well is very difficult to do, especially for a long period of time. And when there's a lot of people and a lot of dynamics going on. So we'll talk about how to do that. The fifth one is to know and share yourself. Um, again, kind of easy to understand what that means, harder to really, really do that on a deep level. And so we'll talk about some ways to do that. Uh, the sixth one, dealing with problems. And as we approach this topic, I, I would like for us all to think about problems as not so much problem people, but problem dynamics that occur in groups. And we'll talk about what some of those dynamics are that can be coming from a particular person but, or in the way that that person interacts with the group, but some ways that, that that can, different kinds of dynamics can be dealt with from the leader's perspective. Also making space is uh, another strategy, which again is easier said than done. Uh, having to do with sort of allowing some space for, for silence, for um, not knowing all the answers um, and making space for various perspectives. And then finally, ending well. This one really uh, is, is worth emphasizing because I think sometimes we just don't end things well. Uh, we don't end groups well. They just sort of fall off and you know, you have the last group meeting, but there's not that chance to really process. So like, again, when we were talking about process versus content, we don't often uh, take the time to process what has this group meant to everybody? What are you taking with you from the group? And that's something we do a lot in therapy, but I think can be carried into these, any type of small group. Um, so moving a little more in depth, the first strategy is practice faith. Uh, this is a quote from Gather Us In, the presence of faith practices is more important than the perfection of faith practices. So first of all, we're not going to reach perfect perfection. Um, if you tend to be a perfectionist, try to be, you know, just bring your awareness of that into your faith, but uh, also have realistic expectations for yourself. I always feel like in therapy, when I'm working with somebody, uh, you know, setting goals, setting any kind of new practice. So that could be a faith practice or a behavior practice of any sort. Uh, it's best to set smaller kinds of goals that you can have some success with. And when you do that, you tend to get some momentum and feel good about yourself and then be experiencing more successes. So that is a much better experience for people I've noticed and experienced than uh, setting some kind of huge goal and then finding that you don't uh, meet that goal. So, you know, New Year's resolutions would be if you've ever set New Year's resolutions, people always tend to do this, I think, to, you know, set some kind of huge goal. And then usually by February, things aren't going so well. So, um, you know, make the goals doable with your faith. Define your practice. You know, I would encourage you if you're leading a group, just try to choose one thing um, that works for you. So it does not have to be what someone else is doing or what's been recommended specifically to you, but find a practice that works for you. Do what works. Um, if it's not working for you, maybe try to shift it and do something different. And you can think of this as, as the of practicing faith as being sort of foundational for all the rest of the other strategies. If you're, re, if you're leading a um, group that is spiritual in nature, it's sort of like building, you know, if you were doing weight training or a sport, you have kind of the fundamentals that you have to do and then everything else builds on that. That's kind of how I view this. Um, you know, having some sort of prayer practice or something. I'll give you three examples that I have used in my own life. One is to use some kind of devotional. Um, I'll just mention one if you would like an idea. I think this one's um, pretty good. It's called The Disciplines and it's put out by Upper Room, which is my publisher. And actually this year, they do these every year. Um, the one for 2021, this is actually the 2020 that I grabbed, but they do one every year 
uh, it's a book of daily devotions. They're short and yet they have a little bit of depth to them. And for the 2021, I did one of the weeks. Um, so there's different authors that do each week. So you also get a little bit of variety there. It's not all one perspective. It's actually a lot of different kinds of ministry leaders and authors and different perspectives. So I like that, but there are many, many devotionals and daily readings. So choosing the one that works for you is what's important and that you feel drawn to, because if you don't like it, you're probably not going to do it. A second example, uh, I have a friend that makes prayer beads um, and she makes these beads and does suggests a way to use them for prayer. Um, that she wrote a book called Beads of Healing. I'll be sharing a few resources that I like tonight if any of these sound interesting to you, but this book's called Beads of Healing. This book in particular uses the prayer beads uh, for people who've been through trauma of some sort. And it talks a little bit about healing from trauma. She kind of shares a little bit about her story um, and it's really interesting. And, you know, it I think is an appropriate balance of kind of sharing some examples and some practices um, that can work in your spiritual journey. Another example is meditation. Uh, so one other resource is this book called One Breath at a Time. I found this to be a really easy, usable, but again, having some depth sort of resource. And this book goes through five different forms of Christian meditation and describes five different ways of meditating. So you practice one of them for, it's really like a 40 day journey that you could use during Lent, but you could really do it anytime. And it goes through these five different practices. So it's a good way to kind of try out some different ways of meditating and see if there's maybe one that works for you better than others. Or if you like variety, you might wanna practice all of them. But it doesn't have to be those three things, but I think choosing something that is daily and that engages you is a good idea for uh, a faith practice. Also, I want to mention social faith practices. So, you know, what I was mentioning with the previous examples was more individual practices. I think also doing something that is sort of a service to the community, you can do this together with your group. Uh, I was in a group a few years ago where um, Atlanta, it, there's this area of Atlanta called Clarkston where a lot of refugees um, come and settle and um, there's an organization here that gets refugees connected with jobs and homes and um, kind of gets them started. Um, and supports them. So our small group partnered with one particular family and helped them furnish an apartment and get acclimated, um, start to learn English and get their resume together, the different things like that. And uh, that was a really rewarding sort of experience and um, you know, connected us to the community was an opportunity to help. So there are lots of opportunities depending where you are and what kind of things are available that you might look at your group doing together. Strategy two is focus, as I mentioned. And I thought Brene Brown had a great example of how to choose core values in her book, Dare to Lead, um, which is a great leadership book in general. Uh, but this part on values, I especially like. She has a whole list of different values in the book and she encourages you as an individual to choose two of those. And so I, for myself, chose integrity and compassion. And those have, and I, that's kind of stuck with me ever since I re read that book to just kind of revisit those values for myself and ask myself, no matter what's going on in my life, am I living by integrity? Am I living in integrity? Am I being true to myself? Am I doing what I say I'm going to do? Um, and then compassion, you know, am I extending compassion to other people? Am I extending compassion to myself? And so those are meaningful for me, but there's a whole list and I think these, you know, using that list could be a good guide for your group as well. You could also just ask your group to kind of brainstorm 
what values are important to them. It might work well to have everyone write down some ideas separately and then kind of see if there's any in common that everyone comes up with as a group. But having some sort of focus in the beginning is helpful. We mentioned last week, um, you know, there there's some groups that will develop even like a written group covenant that is an agreement maybe to stay confidential, to agree to certain things. So that might be a place where you could incorporate some core values for your group as well and look for a consensus as to what the group values. So there may be some different ideas among your group. You don't have to become obsessed with picking the perfect values, but just you know, choosing some common things that uh, the group wants to focus on. And so that just basically, so everybody's clear, why are we meeting as a group? What is the point of this? Everybody should be able to kind of answer that question. And when the group goes through the various stages that we talked about last week, you know, you might remember the storming stage is where there tends to be a little more conflict, maybe challenging the leader to a degree or different kinds of differences of opinion and uh, perspectives come up. That's a good time to revisit your values as a group and remember why are we meeting um, and that can sometimes help bring a sense of solidarity and um, unity, even when there's differing um, opinions and conflict. So strategy three is to stretch, but not too far. Uh, that has to do again with boundaries. Uh, I know they mentioned in the intro, Lee, I appreciated that the, the um, Taekwondo is a big, Part of my life and and it's something that i've really enjoyed doing i have not been able to do it since covid um and the whole pandemic it's just not uh taekwondo friendly in terms of where we train but uh it was a huge part of my life and and still is kind of a guiding principle there um and when we talk about a focus or values taekwondo has five kind of values behind it, which are courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, and indomitable spirit. So it has like a guiding sense of values. Uh, but I particularly think about Taekwondo with stretching because often in our classes, we would be asked to stretch. It's really important for martial arts that you do a lot of stretching. So I would often be sitting on the floor and we would be with a partner or standing up and we would do these different stretches where the partner pushes you further than you could go on your own, but you have to communicate with the partner about you know, don't not don't push me too far. You know, it's starting to hurt, but yes, do push me a little further. I think I can go a little further. So I love that analogy for um, boundaries, you know, and balance and communication and all kinds of things. But the main principle is, you know, stretch, but not so far that you're hurting yourself, you know, and sometimes we stretch ourselves too far and then there are consequences for that, um, either in getting burnt out or uh, having some kind of um, buildup of stress that is not good for us. So, you know, going to, the, I think a biblical um, sort of example, you know, that there are verses there in Galatians that say bear one another's burdens, but also to carry your own. Um, carry sort of carry your own weight. So I think both of those, you know, healthy theology, I think is a lot about holding two truths at once and sitting with the tension. So boundaries are like that. It's like, you do need to help each other out and you need to have some resources within yourself to um, carry your own um, part. So that's true of everyone in your group too. People do need each other and uh, everybody in your group sort of needs to have some resources of their own as well. And you can encourage them. You don't always have to be the one to step in and take care of things for them. You know, that can set up an unhealthy dynamic. So instead trying to equip them and point them to resources um, can be a good balance. So. Uh, when you think about boundaries, um, and 
I hope everyone knows what I mean by that, but in case you don't, it's, it's like what you say yes to and what you say no to. And we all sort of need to imagine that if you, if you imagine that you're a house, you need to have a fence around your yard that's, that kind of protects a little bit and you decide what comes in and what goes out or what is kept out. And so we all have to make decisions. How many commitments are we going to take on? How many, uh, groups are we going to lead? How many um, responsibilities are we going to be in charge of? And all of that has to do with boundaries. So asking yourself what is in my control and what is out of my control uh, can help ha in having boundaries within your group. So it is not in your control, for instance, if uh, everybody in the group likes the book you're reading or has a great opinion about you as a leader. Um, that those things are partially out of your control. They have to do with other people's perspectives and the things they bring to the group. So focus, it tends to be most helpful to focus on what is in your control, which would be communicating about those things or, um, you know, choosing a study that you feel is a good match for the group, but understanding that there can be differences of opinion and making space for that is okay. And so the, the mindset and the norms and the leadership style that you bring is in your control, but all of the feedback that you get is not. So keeping that in mind can help. Being as clear as possible can help relieve your anxiety and others in the group. Uh, so that also helps. Uh, there's also this, this concept I mentioned, Irvin Yalom, last week, who is sort of the father of group psychotherapy. And he talks about um, people in the group should not really be approaching the group as moviegoers uh, who are just like attending group, but rather that the group should be alive and dynamic and the group should be the movie. It's not like you, the leader, are performing something for the group. It should, it, or at least hopefully it's not that. It, it works better for everybody to feel like they are part of a production um, in terms of this analogy. So everybody has a part basically is a sort of better, healthier way to experience the group. So listening well is strategy four. Um, you know, again, this is hard to do consistently and with depth, but so important. I mean, if you think to yourself, uh, when has someone really been listening to you, even in the past week? Can you think of an example where you know somebody was tuned in and listening and they cared about you? Think about that experience in, in contrast to maybe another time this week where someone was talking or where you were talking to someone and they were not really tuned into you. They were thinking about something else, obviously, or looking in another direction or indicating in some way that they did not value what you were saying quite as much. That is a really different experience. And so hopefully we can, as leaders, create the experience, the first example, where you truly feel listened to. Uh, this is really hard. And uh, you know, I experienced this as a therapist, really wanting to listen well, but just like any human being, I come into a session sometimes or a group meeting or any type of thing that I might be leading with some things on my mind and some things going on in my life that uh, are tough to set aside. So I've come up with a couple of methods to help me do that. Sometimes I've used like an actual little wooden box that I kept in my office for a long time. And I would right before a session, if I had something kind of weighing on me or, or that I was struggling with, I would just write it down on a small piece of paper and stick it in the box. And with that uh, strategy, my goal was to temporarily set it aside and write it down and acknowledge it, knowing that I was gonna come back to it later and deal with it at another time but that I was you know, physically kind of and mentally setting it aside for the, to, in order to give someone else my more full attention. I think that works well. Also, I recently came across something called dissolving paper. I don't know if y'all have heard of that, but you can get it on Amazon. 
And it, it's pretty neat. You can write things on it and then put it in water and the paper itself will just dissolve. And so it's kind of a, a neat thing if, to do as a ritual or something if you are trying to let go of certain things or, you know, I think this could be used um, in this instance if you were getting ready before a group and just needed to let some things go um, or set them aside, that might be another way you could experiment with that. So that you could be creative and do a lot of things, but ultimately the goal is to be present where you are and tuned in and not elsewhere in your mind, worried about the past or the future. Part of what helps you do this is using generous self-care and leaving some margin in your life uh, so that you're not scheduling every second of the day and you know um, have no downtime. I think we all sort of need that downtime to breathe, to transition, to get ready for the group, you know, maybe you even set aside some time right before the group to just breathe, just focus, uh, maybe pray or meditate on the topic for the evening or the group members um, as they get ready to arrive. So just think in terms of generous uh, self-care. Um, you know, being mindful of a lot of us, especially if you're like a helper type personality, you can start to get this anxious need to fix uh, sort of mentality when people start presenting problems or issues or having feelings about things. Um, we can start to really want to help and fix. And that comes from a good place, I believe, within us. And yet it's not always what is experienced as most helpful. Sometimes it's really helpful for us just to be present with people listening again and not worrying so much about what does this person need to do about this or what advice do I need to give? It's more just being with them in that moment. And again, you can sort of reflect on your own experience. When is a time when somebody has been really present with you and heard what you were talking about in a way that made you feel cared about, you may not have needed ideas or fixing from them so much as you just needed them to kind of be with you in that moment and help you come to some of your own conclusions about what to do. So along with that, try not to worry so much about what you'll say when the person's done sharing or having a perfectly uh, packaged empathic response for them. Uh, just trust yourself and be present with them. Uh, I believe I pointed to the example of Job's friends. Um, last week, I may have mentioned it, but that one always comes to mind when I think about listening and silence, uh, you know, that his friends sat with him for seven days uh, in that story and uh, didn't say a word at first, then, then they started to talk and things didn't go as well. But, you know, being present, being silent and present is often uh, goes a long way. And having some flexibility with your plan is important. So that is gonna create space to listen when you're not so tied to your agenda for the evening that you're kind of skipping over what people are saying. Make sure that you're making space and keeping that in balance with keeping a structure for the group. So this one is extremely important, I think, strategy five, which has two parts to it, knowing yourself and sharing yourself, which are two big things in and of themselves, but they're kind of encompassed both in strategy five here. Um, the, this goal is to, first of all, have some self-awareness as a leader and I believe that goes a long way to help us be um, practicing humility, knowing that we have our own struggles. Uh, we certainly are not perfect as leaders and you know we can make, we're better able to make space for all kinds of perspectives and struggles and, and sharing various kinds of things when we are aware of our own need to do that as well. And, have re spent some time reflecting. Um, someone asked last week, 
how do we encourage vulnerability and sharing? I think one of the main ways you can do that is to be authentic yourself as a leader and be willing to be somewhat vulnerable as a leader. So those are different, you know, authentic being true to yourself. You can do that anywhere with anyone. Um, vulnerability really is best done within a trusting relationship, which hopefully is developing in your group as you uh, move week to week and get to know each other and establish that safety and rapport. Um, vulnerability is, you know, is a good idea as a leader and as a group member, but really only if the relationship can support that. So, you know, the goal is to have the, the sort of relationships in the group that support people being vulnerable. Um, so, and I think this just, this quote kind of helps me to come back to and to remember you know, that self-awareness is not some kind of project that's going to be completed at some point by a milestone birthday or any other day, but it's an ongoing process that continues to unfold. We're always continuing to learn things about ourselves and how we, uh, how we are, how we relate to other people. And, you know, there's all kinds of unexpected twists and turns that you might encounter. Um, it doesn't need to be feared and it doesn't have to be completely mastered in order to be a group leader. Uh, so we generally also feel pretty honored when someone trusts us with a difficult truth. So if someone is sharing something that you sense is hard for them to talk about, that's so important how you respond. Um, so I think something that's helpful when you really sense that someone's being vulnerable is to respond by saying, thank you for, for sharing what you're sharing. I feel really moved that you, uh, that you shared that or something along those lines that feels authentic to you. Uh, because I, I attended a group on Zoom recently that was like a Zoom retreat. And I really appreciated one woman on the retreat who said, you know, I, I am willing to share things vulnerably, but it's really important to me that people respond in some way after I do that. And can you just, I just want to ask for feedback, you know, kind of in advance, can someone respond um, when I do that? And I thought that was really helpful for her to voice. And then, you know, it, it was a good example of letting other people know what your needs are and, you know, and I think probably everyone there kind of understood that need to know that someone's hearing you, especially over Zoom. I think if you're having a Zoom group, we talked a little bit about virtual groups last week, but uh, you know, thinking about how, how you're perceived on Zoom is different than when you're sitting in a room together. It might be harder to know what is everybody thinking and feeling as I'm sharing this. So you might need to verbalize that more as the leader. So here we are at some writing prompts. Last week we did this and I wanna invite everyone who is open to this experience again to grab a pen and paper. And again, the goal when you do a writing prompt is to just try to write as freely as you can and to not pick up your pen. Um, and I'll just keep track for three minutes and uh, I'm gonna ask you to just choose which one or the other that you would like to do. This is really just for yourself um, or one can flow into the other, however you'd like to do it. But the general theme is thinking about an experience that taught me a lot about myself was. So think in terms of how did I gain self-awareness through that experience? I learned through that experience that I whatever. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and time, uh, time three minutes starting now. And I'll tell you when that's up. And I just invite you to reflect on that. Okay. So go ahead and finish up the last part of what you're working on. Last sentence. Um, I hope you've been able to reflect in those couple of minutes on something that helped you dig a little deeper within yourself and learn something. Um, all kinds of experiences can, can allow us to do that. 
some things that I've seen help people and that have helped me over the years are things like journaling. I've done a ton of journaling. Some people like it, some people don't. I've found through working with clients, uh, but doing these sort of prompts or just free, free flowing journaling uh, can be a really helpful prompt for understanding yourself. Therapy, of course, I'm going to recommend um, to anyone who hasn't tried it. You know, I know that may not be the route for everyone. There's certainly many ways that you can explore your own dynamics. Um, but if you are interested in therapy and have never uh, done it or feel like you might need it or want it right now at this point, uh, there's two websites I'd recommend. One is called betterhelp.com if you want more of a telehealth online experience. A lot of people are doing telehealth now anyway, still. Uh, also psychologytoday.com. And that one has a lot of different therapist profiles that you can, you can do a search um, on there to find a therapist that might be a good fit for you. Uh, so that's another one, mentoring, reading. Um, some people really like tests like the Enneagram uh, or other kinds of inventories like that. I'm not an Enneagram specialist or anything, but I've, I've been told that maybe I'm a four because I kind of resist being put in a category. So then they tell me I'm a four, I don't know. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting to read about, but there's all kinds of things like that to learn more about yourself. When you think about sharing, so knowing yourself was the first part, when, sharing is the other part. And you're sitting in a group, maybe you've had this experience where you're sort of sitting with something and wondering, should I share this thing right now? Uh, well, I'm hoping that these questions can help guide you in that moment. You may not ask yourself all of these questions in that moment, but there are, they're meant to be a guide for deciding, is this a good time for me to share this thing that I'm thinking about sharing? And one question to ask yourself is, are you feeling emotionally present in the group and grounded? Um, and, you know, that meaning you are in your body feeling present, um, not up in your head somewhere disconnected. Uh, but if you're feeling kind of present and grounded, that might be a good time to share. How are you feeling in general, just in terms of your emotional state is good to be aware of. Um, are you willing in that moment to take an emotional risk or uh, in sharing something more vulnerable about yourself? Uh, some days you may feel more like taking that risk than others, and that's completely okay. Um, in fact, that's a really important to monitor within yourself and respect within yourself. Also, can this, this kind of gets at what I was saying earlier, can this relationship, these relationships in this group support this thing that I wanna share and this vulnerability that I'm thinking about uh, uh, moving toward uh, having an experience of vulnerability? Can these relationships support it? That's really the key question. Hopefully they can, especially over time in the group. And you can facilitate that again by expressing that there's safety and that you're encouraging confidentiality, that you are sharing some things that are relatively vulnerable and open. Also ask yourself, am I sharing an often enough in a balanced way? So do I have all these things built up that just feel like they're gonna come spilling out if I open the valve? Uh, or am I regularly sort of sharing with people in my life? And this is one more time that I'm going to share something uh, with a group that might help inform whether this is a good time to do that. What will I actively disclose and what will I um, say if I'm asked? It might be helpful to think about in that moment. And this one is key. I think, what is my purpose in sharing or what do I need from the group? Think about uh, for instance, like the, the example I gave about the woman that said, I'm, I'm going to share some things, but I would like a response uh, of, some, of support or some perspectives on what I'm sharing. Permission to Feel is a book by Mark Brackett that I feel is very informative regarding emotional expression. So if this is something that 
is out of your comfort zone or relatively new to you um, in terms of having a wide vocabulary of emotion. Uh, we're not always good at this. Um, and it is a skill that sort of needs to be developed like any other skill. And the first step, so this is a handy sort of acronym that Mark Brackett has come up with and written the whole book about is in the shorthand is ruler. So you can kind of keep that in mind when you think about uh, healthy ways to deal with emotion. First, by recognizing it. Secondly, understanding what the emotion is, what it's about, knowing some things about emotion. For instance, people who feel sad, often a need that goes with that is a need for comfort. Or you know, people express, people experience anger often when maybe there's been a boundary violation of some sort uh, with them. Or you know, I mean, there's lots of reasons why you can ex experience any emotion, but understanding is part of the process after you recognize it. Being able to label it and have a vocabulary for emotion is another set of skills. And then expressing is. Uh, kind of the next step. So we can all stay in a very intellectual place around emotion sometimes and talk a lot about it and recognize it and label it. But then comes the challenge of expressing and regulating it, which is the part that a lot of people um, I encounter have a harder time with. Maybe they don't express their emotion very openly or they have trouble regulating it. When they do express it, they have a really hard time kind of knowing what to do to allow the whole wave of emotion to be there and then how to get themselves kind of internally regulated to get, um, for instance, through maybe some deep breathing or um, some ways that they extend compassion toward themselves in order to not sort of spiral into a negative um, place around their emotion or get dysregulated. It happens to all of us that we do get dysregulated sometimes. And so the, it's, a, it's a skill set to know how to get back to um, a calmer, kind of a calm, curious state uh, in our bodies. So I hope that acronym is, is helpful to you. The sixth strategy is about dealing with problems. And again, if you can think about this as a problem dynamics rather than a problem person in your group, I think it sort of helps to not, um, you know, to, to just think of the interactions in the group as ways to work towards solutions rather than, you know, well, we just need to not have that person there or something. So the dynamics that can be an issue one is the idealized leader. Sometimes you'll you'll have like people that with pleaser kind of personalities in your group and they just want to kind of please the leader or be like the leader. And so it can help you not to have that dynamic if you are sharing openly and vulnerably and making it clear that you're just a human being like everybody else in the group. Turn-taking can also be a dynamic that develops. Sometimes I've seen this in therapy groups, but also all kinds of groups where everybody just feels like they're taking a turn answering a question. And what is not good about that, I mean, it does allow everyone to kind of take a turn and there may be a time and place for that, uh, but it can also start to feel a little scripted or and there, you sort of lose the, the flow and the life of the group that it can um, take on that just feels more alive. So, you know, if you can do, if you can encourage more of a free flowing, people just jump in and respond to one another, I think that works better. One person monopolizing and talking a lot is sometimes an issue uh, in groups. And so, you know, the, I think the best way to deal with that is um, to both validate what the person's saying and um, let them know you hear them, you, you hear that their contribution is valuable and to make a statement about that uh, and kind of coupled with that to invite others' perspectives into the conversation. So, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's a really good perspective. I wonder what others in the group are thinking about that perspective right now. 
I often do that in groups to try and engage other people too. It might not just be because someone is monopolizing, but just because I'm trying to engage other people. Another problem dynamic is if people aren't attending, obviously that can be a problem. Or if they drop out of the group, people I believe should always be respected for what choice they wanna make about that. But I think as the leader, it's important that you communicate. So if they've missed a session or a couple of sessions to maybe just check in with them and, and say, hey, I've noticed that um, you weren't there these couple of weeks or this week, uh, just wanted to check in. Is there anything you wanna talk about? You know, just kind of opening the door like that, um, not shaming them, not, um, you know, being negative about it, but just inviting a conversation about, is there anything that you wanna talk about? I, and letting them know that you noticed they were gone, I think makes a difference. It lets them feel valued and important. Um, spiritual competition should be discouraged. Um, hope that's kind of obvious, but you know, just it's not a competition to see who can um, be the most insightful or know the most about theology or whatever, but just try to discourage competition, try to value all perspectives and um, invite all uh, expressions. Some other types of problems that you might encounter are excessive silence. So making some space for silence is helpful, uh, but it can become excessive at times. So, you know, uh, just inviting people to uh, share in the leadership of the group, to delegate some parts of the group to other people, to asking people to share about something specific could be ways that you deal with that. Sometimes people have confusing nonverbal behavior, like they're, what they're saying does not match the emotion that they're conveying. So maybe they're talking about something really serious, um, but laughing, or they're crying, but they're saying everything's fine. Um, so those are things as a leader, I think, to just gently sort of point out, um, not, not in a negative way, but just to say, you know, I'm aware that what you're talking about is really serious. Um, are you okay? Like, is there more that you wanna say about that? Is there anything else you're feeling about that? And to invite that in. Sometimes, and so this was one of the questions that came up uh, via email is what do you do with kind of a Debbie Downer sort of personality within the group? A lot of complaining and negativity. I think the best way to approach this is to first of all, validate how hard things are for them. Because I think a lot of times when this happens, the person is wanting some sort of, um, wanting someone to hear that they are really struggling. And so if you can validate, it sounds like that is a really hard kind of situation that you're in. I am so sorry you're going through that. And to authentically give them some support around it and couple that with, what are you planning to do as a next step in dealing with this? Like to ask them to kind of speak about an action they're going to take that will, that assumes they are taking some responsibility for whatever, whatever they're dealing with. So you're supporting them and sort of challenging them at the same time. There are certain personality dynamics um, that can be, uh, particularly difficult. Um, there, you know, sometimes can be sort of an all or nothing or an always in crisis sort of personality type. Uh, somebody who's really up and down. Um, again, you know, it's not about um, problem people. We all have dynamics that are difficult at times, but if you consistently see this sort of thing, uh, with a particular person, you might think about pulling them aside later, um, asking if everything, you know, is going okay, if they need some added support. It, it is okay to um, refer people to other supports, you know, that what, whatever group you're leading doesn't have to be their only support in their life. And then particularly if they're coming in with a lot of needs, uh, it may be especially important to make sure they're connected with 
some other supports as well. And that doesn't all have to be you. So again, that goes back to boundaries and you don't have to take total care of every need that every group member has. But it may be part of your role to communicate about those needs and help connect to them. Okay. So strategy seven is um, making space. And so I was mentioning silence you know, we do need some silence in the group. And another thing that can happen as a leader that I have found is pressure to keep talking. If there's any silence, you might feel as the leader that you have to fill that silence. And silence can be very uncomfortable uh, for the leader or for anyone in the group. Uh, even one minute of silence, you'd be surprised how long that actually feels if you're sitting in a group that is being silent. Uh, and nobody really is knowing who's going to talk next. But if you can tolerate a little bit of that silence as the leader, I think it's extremely helpful to the group because there are people, I think often, who are sitting on something that they're thinking about sharing, but they're not sure if they want to be vulnerable and they're not sure if they want to take that risk. And if you jump in to talk every time there's silence, or if someone in the group does that, then you're not opening up that space for people who are uncertain to delve into a deeper level of vulnerability. And so I think this is really, really important to let yourself become uncomfortable a little bit and sit with some silence. And you may be surprised who jumps in with what, uh, with that silence. And you don't have to wait forever. I mean, you could, if you just create some space and some permission, maybe ask an additional question, like, is there anything else that anyone is wanting to share? Leave some space and then move on. It's also okay to not know the answers and to not know how to respond to somebody, not know the answer to what someone is asking. It's okay as the leader to just say, I'm not sure about that. What do others in the group think? Um, who has something to offer in this moment around this particular question? Or let's let's all consider this together. Where could we find find out more about this thing that we're asking? And search together. You're on a journey together, and I think that's a helpful way to think about it as the leader. Ending well is the last strategy. And, uh, you know, again, this is valid. You can, you can end a group. It doesn't mean that the group has failed or anything. It, there's closed groups that are a set time or open groups. Either way, it's okay to end. Just do it with some sensitivity and with some advance notice. So uh, try to be aware that for a lot of people, any kind of ending or transition brings up other losses that they've had in their life. And it is really important to handle it with some sensitivity and just create some space in the group for people to talk about the fact that the group is ending and what, what has the group meant to them? What are their plans going forward? How do they feel about the group ending? That can all be really, really important for helping them have a good ending and for you to be able to say as, as a group, we have ended well, rather than leaving kind of loose ends that nobody ever really addresses, um, which can be a problem. So uh, quickly, I so we're gonna uh, switch into the breakout rooms in a moment, but I do wanna just allow, you know, an opening here for Q and A if you do have um, questions. When we move into the, to the breakout rooms, I'm gonna ask you to look at handout three together as a group. That is a handout on some just kind of different tips for setting boundaries, taking care of yourself and functioning well as a leader. When you're in the breakout rooms, I'm gonna ask you to look at that list and choose one thing on it that you feel you do well and one thing you'd like to improve and then to talk about that as a group. So that's what you'll do in the breakout rooms. But first, if there's any questions, um, I can try to answer those now.
Hi, Angela. I have a comment. This is Martha. Not as much a question, but sure. I was, I was, um, I liked when you talked about in a group to take turns. And it just seems like every meeting I've been in in the last year does the whole mutual invitation thing where, you know, Angela invites um, Lee to speak and then Lee invites the next person. Okay. And that can be helpful, as you said before, because everybody gets a chance to speak, but it's certainly kind of a, um, it can be a, not a flow because yeah. somebody may not be, even though they're given the right to pass, very rarely do they feel comfortable passing. Sure. And, it, and meanwhile, you could just see someone's like really wanting to be called upon, but they're not, you know, it right. just is interesting. So, and yeah. I think it's just because the, the nature of Zoom, but I think almost, I mean, I'm thinking about every meeting is like this whole mutual invitation or talking stick or whatever you want to call it. So I appreciate you saying that sometimes you just have to kind of let the flow go and that's okay. And then as long as people don't monopolize, as long, you know, you still keep those other balances, but I don't know if you've experienced that too in a lot of Zoom meetings, that whole mutual invitation. Yes, I have actually um, recently that happened and I found myself feeling exactly what you describe, which is, you know, oh, I think I want to talk right now. Oh, but it's not my turn. And then, you know, oh, wait, I don't know if I want to talk now and I'm being called on. So, I mean, that can take us all back to that like classroom environment. I think of, I don't know if I want to be called on right now. So depending on the person, some people will be fine with it. Some people may not, but you can experiment. And that may be something to process as a leader. Like how did everyone like it that we did this mutual invitation? And if everybody says we loved it, then you might go with it. But if they don't, maybe you try something different. Anything else? Um, hi, Angela, this is Angelica. I had a question about the, the difficult group where someone's kind of monopolizing the conversation. Do you mm -hmm. just cut off that person at some point or just hope that they'll read the room and stop at some, because mm -hmm. I've been in Zooms that are a little tense in that way. Yes, great question. Uh, I, I think that there is a time to cut off, but how you do that is important. So as long as it happens with some validation, you know, there are times where I, where I do interrupt someone and I'll say, I'm going to stop you for just a second. And I think what you're saying is really important. I do wonder, you know, if anybody like based on what you said about this and this, does anyone else have a response to that? And so that's probably how I would approach it. But I think there is a time to interrupt when, you know, sometimes people out of their anxiety or just that's just their style, you know, they, they're just talking a while and it is part of our role as a group leader to kind of balance things. And if you are feeling like, you know, that person probably needs to wrap it up, chances are everybody in the group or at least other, some others in the group are probably feeling the same way. And the group can feel better taken care of by you as the leader if you are willing to kind of be assertive in that way. That's really helpful, thank you. Sure. Okay, well, should we uh, switch to the breakout rooms at this point? And let's do 15 minutes and then there'll be a short, um, I do have a little more to present afterward. Um, I do wanna be mindful of the time, but um, please come back afterward and I'll have a little bit more to present and we'll do 15 minutes now in the breakout rooms. Great, I, so I hope uh, you had a chance to look over that list. Um, and note some things that you're already doing well and also make some goals for yourself. I hope you'll keep that handy uh, to kind of keep your boundaries in check. I think it's something that we all benefit from revisiting uh, on a regular basis because it's very easy to overextend ourselves sometimes or uh, lose track of where, where we best keep our boundaries. So uh, I just want to conclude uh, before we wrap up for the night with a few thoughts about putting all these strategies into practice. So now you have your eight strategies. I hope those will be helpful to you. I think they all, all of them are, have proven to me to be very effective uh, things to keep in mind um, in any kind of group that I have led or been a part of. 
one thought is to, no matter how your group is unfolding, to try and maintain a curious rather than judgmental stance toward yourself and toward what's going on in the group. Uh, groups, like I said, are, are systems that are constantly changing and presenting new challenges to us. So they're, they're hard to manage sometimes and hard to lead sometimes. So try not to be too hard on yourself as a leader if something's not going well, but to instead be curious. If something didn't go well, wonder within yourself why that happened or have a conversation with uh, other leaders or people who were there in the group to try and understand it. Um, it is not up to you to do everything perfectly. It's just up to you to show up and lead and maintain a curious um, perspective and learn from it and move forward. So whatever you notice, make adjustments uh, as needed. So if something's not working, don't keep doing what is not working. You know, you may need to revisit the structure of the group or the ways that uh, you're interacting together. Uh, it's better to make an adjustment than to keep doing something that's not working. Uh, taking notes and journaling can help. Again, this is something that uh, some people are going to like doing as a leader, others maybe not so much. But if you are a person who takes notes or journals anyway, this is a great idea right after the group to jot down some thoughts about what you think went well, what you think you have questions about or would want to do differently next time or want to make sure you remember to revisit next time. Uh, maybe have a journal that you use just for that group. Uh, that could be helpful. You know, you know, prayer practice uh, before the group starts or during the group is also helpful. Uh, using your resources such as other leaders, uh, um, community resources, you know, support groups, knowing about support groups in your area, so that if there is somebody in your need, in your group that is presenting a lot of needs that you think maybe go beyond the scope of your group, then connecting them with resources outside or a therapist or something um, can be helpful. And sometimes they just need a prompt to feel like that's okay to do. Uh, so that's not something I would probably do in, I wouldn't do in front of the group, but maybe one-on-one -on -one with somebody in your group to ask, you know, is there more that you're needing? Is there some way I could help you get connected? And yourself asking for help is also important. So make sure that you are taking good care of yourself and you're uh, connecting with whoever you need to so that you are going into the group already feeling supported and like you're not, you're not just isolated as a leader or alone with all of the group's needs, but you are connected. Um, that's incredibly important. Not just within your group, but with other leaders. Think about what is your specific goal uh, week to week, not just in the group as a whole, but specifically, and how you'll put it into action uh, that particular week. You know, also maintain flexibility so it all needs to be kept in balance, but make uh, small adjustments each, each week or as you're thinking about the group each day uh, in preparation for it. It may be helpful to ask yourself if you're already in a group, what parts of, so we've basically mapped out kind of the ideal group experience, or at least some thoughts about what that might look like. So ask yourself, what are, it, this is a kind of what I was prompting you to do in the breakout rooms. Ask yourself what is already going well. Um, try not to get discouraged with all the things you feel like you could do better, but instead, you know, it's okay to think about that, but also think about what am I already doing well? What am I already pretty good at? And let's keep that going. If what you're doing isn't working again, do something different. Uh, you know, check in with yourself. If you are feeling really stressed uh, when someone's speaking or, uh, you know, it just the group in general is feeling sort of off to you on a particular night, that's really important to pay attention to and maybe even voice that in the group. Is anyone else feeling like we're just a little off tonight? 
I'm having this um, feeling as I sit here with everyone that, you know, things feel different than normal. And sometimes just putting that out there can really open up a powerful discussion. And we talked about the, the ruler acronym. And so remember to notice through our bodies, the information and the emotion that we can um, really not get at any other way besides to listen to how we feel. So that wraps up what I have prepared tonight. I did add my website and email there. Um, you know, if you do have questions you think of um, after the fact that we didn't get to during the q and I know that was fairly short. So please feel free to reach out if you have further questions. And um, I'm just grateful to be here and, and grateful for everyone's um, attentiveness and participation. So thanks. <laughs>